Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Kathy, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi. I'm a particularly nervous alcoholic right now. Um, before I get started, I'd like to thank Paul and Glenn and the rest of the committee for a wonderful conference. Um, if this is the first one you guys have done out here, it's, it's fantastic. I want to thank everybody for a wonderful time. And I also want to thank the committee for asking me to come and share. Um, I have to take my jacket off. Okay, you guys. <laughs> I'm nervous. I'll stop at the jacket. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I came back to Santa Cruz this summer, um, and that's where I met Glenn. Um, I had moved from California about 10 years ago. I lived in, in Santa Cruz, and when I left Santa Cruz, I swore that I would never come back to this town. Um, <laughs> And you know that this town was the problem, not me. Um, this was the town that I quit bragging about my drinking and started lying about my drinking. And it was in this town that I did my first armed robberies. It was in this town that I traded my hope for drugs in the back rooms of bars and parking lots. And I traded my youth for the squalor of the streets of Santa Cruz. And there were people who sold drugs and wanted money from me who were real anxious to find out where I moved to when I left this town. And, uh, and I knew that I would never be back. And, um, and through this program of Alcoholics Anonymous and my higher power, I found myself sitting in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous in Santa Cruz, California. And for that, I'm truly grateful. We are the miracle people, you guys. And um, as I look out at you all right now, I see the face of God in every seat out there. And I'm grateful that we're in this together. Somebody gave me this, and I brought it up to remind myself, like, I am the problem. <laughs> we are the solution. I had to, before I started speaking, I went outside and um, tried to get quiet and get centered and ask God for some help. All weekend long, I've been eating my fingernails and um, scratching and, and picking my nose and stuff, trying to, like, <laughs> you know, I want, I want to do good, <laughs> you know. And uh, when I was out there, I was reminded that it was my job to carry the message and not spread the disease. And... Uh, <laughs> If I, if I get out of the way, may, maybe God will use me to say something meaningful to somebody in this room. And uh, welcome to the newcomers, and I'm glad I'm here, and I'm glad you're all here. And so, here we go. I was born into um, an alcoholic family. For those of you who uh, have similar experiences, I'm sure you know that no one survives an alcoholic household. My father was a drunk. My mother was a saint. Um, <laughs> I knew what his problem was, but it wasn't until many years later that I understood what her problem was. That she also was an alcoholic, but she had three small children to take care of, and she had to take care of my father. She had to worry about getting food on the table, finding him when he was gone, and when she found him, getting him out of whatever he was in. She tended to be angry, and she tended to be um, distracted. And um, I have two sisters. My mother gave birth to three only children. <laughs> Having grown up in an alcoholic household, those of you out there, I'm sure can identify, we were all isolated, we were all alone, and we were all suffering through our own pains, not knowing that the person sleeping in the bed next to ours was going through the exact same thing. We are all in recovery today. And for that, I'm truly grateful. Um, it's evidence to me that there is a power working in our lives, in all of our lives. But I was raised, or born into this alcoholic household, and um, I used to start my story when I was age 12, because that was as far back as I could remember, and uh, that's when I thought I started drinking. And uh, just recently I moved to North Carolina, and I was sitting in a meeting, and, and you know we were all sharing, yeah, well, I've been drunker than you longer, and then I always started drinking and all this stuff, and I realized that... Um, that I started drinking, really, when I was like three or four years old. I, I just remember this uh, little kid walking around in diapers who used to drain the bottom off of her, her dad's Coors beer, you know, and uh, and I loved it. 
And we used to go over to my uncle's house. Now, I don't know if my uncle is an alcoholic or not. He used to, on occasion, throw um, the television set and pieces of furniture out the plate glass window. <laughs> but I don't know if he was an alcoholic. But we'd go over to his house, and I was four or five, maybe six at the time, and I'd run around and drain the bottom of the glasses of screwdrivers and stuff. So that's when I started drinking, and that was the end of my social drinking. <clears throat> <laughs> so, um, I recall when I was a kid growing up, before I ever got into the disease of alcoholism, while I was still in the social drinking stage, um, <laughs> that all I ever wanted out of life was out. When I was a very small child, I used to, um, I know no one here will tell anybody because it's kind of weird, but I used to lock myself in the closet when I was a kid, and draw pictures of Martians on the doors because I knew that, that I was from some other planet and that someday my real parents who were Martians were going to come get me, you know, and take me home because I couldn't fit my inner reality with what was going on out there in my life. You know, I'd come home crying or I'd hurt myself be crying and my father would, or my mother or somebody would say, shut up, don't cry, you're not hurt, and I'd go, oh. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I could never get it right. So I knew that somehow or other from my very earliest memory was of not belonging. And all I ever wanted out of life was out. <clears throat> and that was my goal, was to get somehow off the planet. And it wasn't until I was 12 years old that I found a way to do that. It was wonderful sitting up here, sitting here last night and hearing Chris's story because I identified a lot with what he had to say. Um, uh, growing up, I didn't belong in my family. I learned very early on to stuff my feelings. Um, I learned that um, it was not okay for me to be who I am. And it was not okay for you to be who you were, because if I was who I am, then that would make you all better than, you, than I was. So I started hating you and blaming you for what was wrong with me. And um, before I ever picked up a consciously picked up a drink of alcohol and started on this disease, I started changing my reality to fit what I wanted it to be. Um, the big book talks about selfishness and self-centeredness to the extreme. Um, that, I believe, is the core of my disease. I've experienced it over and over and over again in my life. Um, so anyway, I used to sit out in the front yard um, and wear my fanciest um, slips and play the xylophone and think that I was Shirley Temple and know that a big producer was going to drive by and <laughs> discover me and take me to Hollywood where I'd uh, be a star. And uh, I continued that kind of behavior until I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, <laughs> believing the whole time it would happen. So I grew up with this set of feelings. I knew I was weird. I knew I didn't fit. I knew I didn't belong. And I, I knew all I wanted out of life was out. I was totally alone in a family of five. I hated me. I hated you. And at age 12, I found alcohol. And thank God. I believe that alcohol kept me from going clinically insane for a good portion of my life. And I need to stop here and tell you, um, this last meeting that we had, there was a panel discussion about, you know, do you talk about drugs and alcoholics and all this meeting, if I'm an addict, am I an alcoholic, and all this kind of stuff that goes on. And I call myself an alcoholic because I believe that's the name of my disease. Um, alcoholism has manifested in my life as an addiction to drugs, to men, <laughs> to cigarettes, to coffee, to chocolate, to food, to money, to, um, you know, you name it. But um, the people that named this disease named it in the 30s and the 40s, and they called it alcoholism. And when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was told to identify with the greatest number of people so that I could seek recovery in the most general way. Um, because the more unique I become, the less my chances of identifying and finding recovery are. So I'm an alcoholic. I qualify as an alcoholic addict, but I only have one disease, and the recovery is in the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous for me, and I didn't know that when I picked up a drink at age 12. <laughs> because when I was age 12, my life, in my idea, had um, a lot of promise. It held a lot of promise for me. I, um, when I, w I was standing out here in the um, parking lot right before I spoke, and I was doing what I told you I was doing, I was biting my fingers and picking my nose and scratching and doing all this stuff. And a guy uh, drove by 
in a car and was playing a, a there was a Temptations song from the 60s, late 60s or early 70s on. He had it on the left. And I heard that, and it brought me back to, um, to the dreams and the hopes that I had when I was 12 years old. And um, I was bright, and I knew it. I was fairly good-looking, and I knew it. I was 12 years old, and the world was at my fingertips. And I never once sat down in my little bedroom where I used to write poetry and short stories and go, gee, I think I'll be an alcoholic when I grow up. That sounds like a good thing to be, <laughs> you know. The picture I had for myself was very different than the reality. Um, but when I picked up that drink at age 12, <clears throat> all my choices from that day forward were no longer were taken away from me. And I didn't understand it at the time. <clears throat> so I proceeded on a life. Um, I Actually, I got busted for selling acid first. I think I was 12 when that happened. And uh, continued to get... Uh, highly addicted to, to drugs and alcohol. Um, most of my life from age 12 until I walked into the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous were spent either drinking and using, recovering from drinking and using, or planning to drink and use. <laughs> so when I came into AA, you know, and they said, well, you've got to, like, deal with life on life's terms, I was going like, <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that, you know. I need the drugs. Um, <laughs> you know. So anyway, I had this set of feelings that didn't match my reality, and I knew that if I, if I ever started expressing them, I was either going to become the hole in the donut and disappear entirely, or I was going to kill somebody. And alcohol gave me a way to keep those feelings stuffed down inside of me. And it also gave me a way to feel that I was okay. Alcohol gave me freedom. And drugs gave me freedom. I went from this kind of weird, sort of locked up, bound up in self-centered fear little person to this very charming, outgoing, <laughs> laughing person who could be okay in any situation. I overshot the mark quite a few times, so my uh, <clears throat> my first drink of alcohol, my first drunk that I that I can remember, uh, I went over to my girlfriend's house, and she had a. a father who uh, was uh, an executive, so he had like a bar, you know, with all different kinds of stuff in it, and I didn't know what was what my dad stuck to screwdrivers mostly, and uh, so we just mixed a little bit of everything in this one jar, and uh, she took a couple sips, and, we, and I drank the rest of it, <laughs> and um, I threw up and passed out, and I decided right then that the way to be a successful drinker was not to throw up. And uh, so I, I tried very hard not to do that. So I don't know how I got through um, high school. I got through high school drinking, you know, drinking and using. I don't know how I did it. I just did it. And um, my disease, uh, looking back now, I can see where by the time I was 16 or 17 years old that I was firmly entrenched in this disease. Um, I was beginning to, like, not know how to have friends. Everybody else, all my friends, were, like, going to dances and uh, learning how to meet boys and how to dress and how to shave their arms and legs and stuff. And I was out in the field getting loaded and, and uh, drinking booze, you know. Um, I never learned how to do any of those things. When I got sober, I realized I was a 12-year-old trapped in a 28-year-old body, and I had to learn how to do things like wear underwear, you know, <laughs> but the very basic stuff. <laughs> but while I was in high school, things were pretty good. Um, and then when I got out of high school, the world got very, very scary for me all of a sudden. Um, all of a sudden, I was expected to um, be some kind of a person. Um, the people I was buying drugs from expected me to pay for them. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, cops were starting to say, well, you can go to jail if I take you in, you know. Um, employers were starting to expect me to show up. You know, people in my life were expecting me to give them something like love or friendship or even tell them who I am. And I didn't know how to tell them. I didn't know how to do anything. Because what I grew up with was despair, fear, isolation, and loneliness. And that's all I knew, and I didn't know I knew it. 
and that was my daily reality. And that was life at 18. Um, and since I didn't have an answer for any of these people, when they would say, you know, like, why did you sleep with my boyfriend? <laughs> you know? Or, you know, why did you steal my stuff? Um, like, that's not, that's not who my mom raised me to be. That's not who my dad raised me to be, you know. I didn't mean to do those things. But they didn't understand, you know, like life owed that to me. They owed that to me. And uh, if you wouldn't give it to me, I'd take it from you, you know. And it wasn't my fault. I was a victim in all this because I didn't have a fair shake at life because my parents were alcoholics, you know. And it's not my fault. And so I was a victim in all of this, according to me. And then when people started asking me for some answers here, or asking me to be who I am, or wanting some love, or try to give me some love, I'd start moving around. <laughs> I couldn't stay in one town very long. It, um, it got real nasty real quick, <laughs> wherever I was. Um, and as all this was happening... <clears throat> The, the child at 12 years old who used to listen to Simon and Garfunkel songs and write poetry about how beautiful life was or how, ah, oh my, I, a friend of mine from Hawaii just on camera. Um, um, that person that, that had to hope and had to promise and, had, uh, and, and saw a little bit of, of goodness in life got more and more lost. I started chipping away at her because the kinds of things I had to do to get the booze and the drugs, I had to start trading off pieces of Kathy to do that. And I didn't know that that's what I was doing, you know. And I didn't care. I was having fun. You know, life was real exciting for me for a lot of times. You know, when you go out on a, on a, a warm summer evening and you're not sure whether you're going to get arrested or not, you know, and you're not sure if you're going to wake up next to it again, <laughs> you know. I have to figure out who or what it is or how many of it is in the bed with you. You know, that's exciting stuff, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Keeps you going from day to day. You know, my drinking was never the problem. What the problem was was those brief moments that I had to sober up, you know. <laughs> Those brief moments where I had to look myself in the eye and realize that what I was when I was five and six years old isn't there anymore. You know, that what I was was something else entirely. And I didn't know what that was, but I knew that what it was was stealing from her family and was screwing over her friends and was willing to go to any lengths to get drunk or loaded. And I didn't want it to be that way. But I didn't know what else to do. So I started moving around, <laughs> because that's always been a solution for me. You know, when things get hot in one spot, move. And uh, <clears throat> so I believe, I'm, tr I'm trying to remember, it's hard. I'm <laughs> if, if I lose my story, my sister's sitting right down here. She's got more sobriety than I do. She'll come up and tell my story for me. <laughs> she knows it. <laughs> So I hit the road. I was the queen of the geographics, and it wasn't okay for me to say, you know, it's, I was changing my reality to make the things I was doing okay. You know, so it wasn't okay for me to say, well, you know, like I did an armed robbery in Santa Cruz, so I had to get out of town. I couldn't say that. So what happened was I, I first I moved to Santa Cruz, um, I think, yeah. I moved to Santa Cruz, and I got into school to be a poet. I was going to be a poet and I was going to school up here, and um, and I was doing all those things I told you about in the back alleys, and I needed money, so I did a couple armed robberies, and uh, owed some people some money, and those aren't the people that come up to you and say, may I please have my money, you know? And, uh, and so I moved to, New to uh, Connecticut. I was on my way to New York to be a rock and roll star. Um, <laughs> I ended up in Connecticut through a series of bad breaks and misunderstandings, which wasn't my fault. I was a victim in all this, you know. And, ooh, and, um, and so I was in Connecticut uh, trying to get to New York to be a rock and roll star, and, and my life fell apart there, too. I was The landlord came over on Christmas Eve. It was 15 below, and they 
took all the uh, furniture out of the house and put it on the sidewalk and changed the locks. And I said, oh, I guess we're moving now. <laughs> you know? Because paying the right rent wasn't important. You know, I had to get loaded. I didn't realize that that's what had happened. But what the process that had happened for me in this town was that I went from wanting to get drunk and loaded to where my drinking and using became medicinal. I had to drink and use, and I didn't know it. And I had slipped a few notches down, and I was willing to do a few more squalid things to go to any lengths to get drunk or loaded. And I knew terror, I knew fear, I knew despair, and I knew isolation, and I didn't know that that's what I knew. So I moved <laughs> back to California and uh, to go to school to be a psychologist. <laughs> and I did that. In fact, you know what? I told myself that I... See, the problem is that, like, none of you people out there believe this stuff. I met all you guys in bars, right? You know, and we talk stories. I go, what are you doing? Well, you know, I'm a poet. Uh, oh, what have you published? Well, nothing right now. But and everybody else around me is going, yeah, right, you know, get this trick. And, and I'm believing this stuff. So, um... I was about 90 days sober when I realized to my horror that I didn't have my master's in psychology. And, uh, I had to make amends for that to my friends. You know, I got a master's in psychology. Anyway, I came to California to, to uh, get my degree in psychology, and I got another job, um, cocktail waitressing, because I had figured out uh, when I was about 16 years old and, or 17 years old and I got a fake ID, I figured out that the, the best place for someone like me to be was in a bar because you're at the source. You don't have to travel so far to get the stuff, you know. And you could just show up for work and drink through your shift and then you get off work. You don't have to worry about where you're going to go drink. You're just right there and the bartender knows you drinks for free. And anyway, so I was working as a cocktail waitress. And, um, and things were starting to get hot. Um, I had, by this time, alienated the remnants of the patience and love that my family had left for me. They were, by this time, well, except for my older sister was in recovery, and they were watching me go down. And in essence, what they said to me, I don't know if they said it verbally or not, but they said, if you want to kill yourself, go ahead, but we're not going to watch. You're not welcome here. And, uh, and another little piece of Kathy got chipped away. And I knew fear, and I knew terror, and I knew despair, and I knew, knew loneliness, and I didn't know that that's what I knew. I just knew that they were fucked, and I moved. And this time I moved to England to be an actress. <laughs> and I was in a bar in England, um, <laughs> and uh, I did go to a play in England. That was as close to acting as I ever got. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, by the way, P.S. I uh, another reason why England was a was a good um, good idea was I happened to pick up a hundred dollar a day crystal meth habit and a little uh, non habit forming marijuana habit. And I knew that if I was anywhere where I could get the stuff, I would. So I moved to England, but it was to be an actress. So I went there, and I was sitting in a bar in England, and. Uh, I looked around the bar and I realized that I'd been to bed with just about everybody in the bar. <laughs> and they were all looking at me and uh, saying, oh yeah, when are you going to go audition? And uh, so I moved to Austria <laughs> to be a world-class Olympic skier. <laughs> and I was sitting in the bar in Austria. <laughs> And I looked around and I realized that I'd slept with nearly everybody in the bar in Austria. And they were wondering why I never went out skiing. <laughs> and uh, asking me, you know, if I wanted to go out on the slopes. So I moved back to England <laughs> to be an actress <laughs> since I didn't make it so good at skiing. Anyway, England didn't work out. <laughs> And I moved to uh, Hawaii to um, research Pacific archaeology for National Geographic. <laughs> and I got a job as a cocktail waitress. <laughs> 
And I told everybody at the bar that I was just in between gigs. What I was really doing there was uh, researching Pacific archaeology for National Geographic. And uh, and the guy that I had drug around with me or followed, I don't know quite how that worked, one day looked me in the eyes and said, like, and I thought he was a scumbag, you know. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, like, I can't handle you any longer. And uh, that was when I tried to kill myself in earnest. Um, when he looked at me, this, this uh, you know, this lower companion who uh, said, I can't deal with you any longer. Another little piece of Kathy got chipped away. And I knew fear, and I knew terror, and I knew isolation, and I knew loneliness, and I didn't know that that's what I knew, you know. And I just kept thinking all the way through. I kept thinking if I could get the right job, the right set of parents, the right man, the right car, the right clothes, the right something, it was all out there. That if I could get the right whatever it was, then that kid who was 12 years old who saw so much hope and promise in life would get her shit together and start walking forward and something would happen. You know, in the meantime, I was researching Pacific archaeology at Hula's Bar and Grill in uh, Honolulu. And, um, <clears throat> and something happened to me in Hawaii, and I'm not real sure what it is. I think it was God in his very kind and gentle way allowed me to start killing myself without really doing it. Um, I was in a land of beauty. I was in a land of paradise. They had some wonderful flowers, bougainvillea, ginger, peacocky, all these wonderful flowers. And I looked out onto the landscape of Hawaii, and what I saw was I saw gray. I saw the face of countless its that I had woken up next to, and I saw bottles of booze and drugs. And that's all I could see. In fact, I was over 90. Well, I was maybe six months sober. I was driving in the car in Hawaii, and I noticed that, like these pink flowers on the side of the road. I go, oh, God, what is that? You know, they're flowers. And have they, have they always been here? You know? um, I, didn't, I didn't know. All I could see was my fear, my terror, my loneliness, my isolation, and I didn't know it. And... Um, so I started in earnest to kill myself. My daily reality was very similar to what Chris was talking about last night. Um, the last eight months of my drink, and I, I just kept sliding down in Hawaii until um, there were no people left. The phone didn't ring anymore. Um, nobody visited anymore. I couldn't buy my way to companionship in the bars anymore in Hawaii. I would always show up with cocaine quaaludes and plenty of free drinks because I worked in the bar. And no one would stay with me till the end of the evening. You know, I had already traded in all the hope and all the promise and all the kindness and all the love that was born into this child of God. I had already traded all that away. You know, I had already hung out in the bathrooms of bars you know, doing funny things with funny people just to get one more fix, you know. And they wouldn't have me anymore. And so I somehow or other thought that maybe alcohol and drugs might have something to do with something. Now, I wasn't an alcoholic, and I certainly wasn't a drug addict, okay. But if I could stop drinking for one day, I could get up to the university, fill out the forms, get into university, get my shit together, and then do something with my life. And every every day I would swear to myself that today was the day I was not going to pick up a drink. I was not going to pick up a drink, and I was going to get up to the university and fill out those applications. And the unfortunate part was that I'd drink so much the night before that in the morning I'd be shaking like this and I couldn't brew coffee. So my daily routine was I'd down a beer to steady my hands enough so I could get the coffee in the machine and, and all that work and um, so I could stay sober, you know. And I didn't realize that it was that first beer that got me. But every morning with this the, the pitiful desperation that only the dying can know, I would swear to myself, take a drink, and I would get my shit together. And by 4 o'clock every afternoon, I was drunk and passed out. And uh, by 9 o'clock, I sobered enough, uh, enough to get to work. I'd show up at work, and 
drink, snort, swallow, and sniff my way through my shift. And I'd sit down at the bar afterwards, and I knew. I See, I, I always drank immediately after work. I'd always drink a shot of tequila with a um, water glass full of white wine back. That was my, you know, just to make sure. That was just a start, you know. Um, and I'd look at that. It always sit before me in front of the bar, and I'd look at that, and I thought, this might have something to do with something here. And I'd say, oh, screw it, you know, down the tequila and drink the, the water. Tomorrow. I'll, I'll, I'll do it tomorrow. And then I'd always end up, you know, coming home, I don't know what time, with what or who or how, and the next day I'd wake up. And I always used to pride myself on I never drank in the morning. <clears throat> that means I wasn't an alcoholic. Well, I never drank in the morning because I never woke up before 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, but then the next day it would be the same thing over and over and over and over again. And I suddenly one day realized that I couldn't even get up to the university to get the applications to fill them out. And another piece of Kathy got chipped away. And I knew terror and I knew fear and I knew despair and I knew loneliness and I didn't know that that's what I knew. You know. And then one day not... Unlike any other day, I'd passed up a number of good stopping places along the way. I've lived in broken-down trucks up by Club Ziani here in the Santa Cruz Mountains. I've spent the night by Goodwill boxes. You know, I've screwed all over my family. I've done armed robbers. I've done all kinds of stuff. I've passed up some good stopping places in my travels. I'm willing to go to any lengths to get loaded. Um, but one day, not unlike any other day, I woke up. And for some reason, and I don't know why, and I'm eternally grateful to my higher power for this, I realized that nothing had changed since I was 12 years old and that nothing was going to change. And the only thing that had changed was that I was hanging out. Well, I wasn't even hanging out with anybody anymore. There was no people left. But I had gotten a little more dirty, a little more squally, a little more lost, and, and that I was dying. And I knew that. I was dying from the inside out, and I was terrified of what that might mean, but I wasn't an alcoholic. Um, and I, I saw real clearly my life. It was almost like it was almost like I was looking through a tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel was a picture of me eating out of garbage cans on Fort Street Mall, which is the Skid Row in Hawaii. And I knew that that was my truth, and I knew that it would be okay when I got there. Because my entire drinking career had been a process of balancing the price with the effect, and I found out that there was nothing so awful that you can't get used to it. And each time my life took a little downward turn, I got used to it, you know, and then it would get a little worse, and I got used to it. And I knew that I'd be eaten out of garbage cans, and I'd get used to it, and it would be okay, as long as I could get loaded. And... Uh, but I didn't want to do that, you know. And I don't know how it all came together. It was a miracle of sorts. I'm sure I'm a miracle of sorts. Well, who do I think I am? You know, it's definitely God working in my life. <laughs> yeah, well, then I decided to get sober, and I've been happy, joyous, and free ever since, you know. <laughs> I got even more terrified. <laughs> And my mother had sent me a letter a couple weeks before that. And she had said in her letter, she by this time had uh, 10 or 12 years of sobriety, as well as my father had several years of sobriety, and my little sister had several years of sobriety. And my mother had written me this letter, and it said, I don't know if you're an alcoholic, honey, and I don't know if I'm an alcoholic, but alcohol, licks anonymous, cured my depression. And I went, oh, okay. You know, maybe I'm not an alcoholic, but I am depressed, you know. And I have a slight problem with relationships, so maybe I can go to Alcoholics Anonymous, get that guy, that car, that job, those clothes, that, you know. I didn't think about getting sober necessarily, uh, but there was a whole lot of stuff I wanted. So I called Alcoholics Anonymous, and um, they were a wonderful man answered the phone and suggested I go to a women's meeting. Now, by this time... Um, I hated women and I didn't trust men, which didn't leave a whole lot of people on the planet that I could talk to, you know. Um, 
But he said, go to this meeting, and I was real grateful that he said that because it gave me three days. Because <laughs> I knew that when I, the day I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, my life was going to become stupid, boring, and glum. <laughs> you know, like I was having so much fun, you know. Um, but my life was going to become stupid, boring, and glum, and it would be over. So I uh, spent the next three days, like, getting used to the idea that I might go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And I showed up at my first women's meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. I was wearing the clothes I'd been wearing for at least one day, I think maybe two. Um, somehow or other, there was this odd substance on my shoes, I think was my own throw-up, but it could have been somebody else's. Um, there was wine stains on the front of my white blouse. I was still fooling myself, telling myself I could get away with wearing white. <laughs> um <laughs> And I was still drunk from the night before, and I was terrified. And I walked into that meeting, and there were all these women there. And there was something going on there that I had never experienced, or if I had, I didn't want to experience it, and I didn't know what it was. But it wasn't fear, terror, isolation, and loneliness, and it scared me. And I sat down in that meeting, and they asked me if I wanted to say something, and I, you know, sort of flung snot all over myself and cried. Um, they tried to feed me, and I tried not to throw up, and I got out of there as fast as I could because it was something that I had no idea what it was. You know, I get very angry sometimes in Alcoholics Anonymous when I hear people tell newcomers, do what you have to do to stay comfortable. You know, if I did what I had to do to stay comfortable, I'd be on junk right now or in jail. Thank you very much. Walking into Alcoholics Anonymous was the most uncomfortable thing I had ever done in my life. And it was that way for a long time because I didn't belong there in my mind. I didn't belong anywhere. You know, those Martians were supposed to come get me, and they never did. I'm still mad at them about that. <laughs> But something happened at that first meeting. And I've come to understand, am I talking too long? Oh, my watch is upside down. I've come to understand that um, I was looking at my watch upside down, so I started to get nervous. Um, <laughs> um, that those, there was something different about those people than the people that I met in the bars and in the streets, and I didn't know what it was. And it was just enough they gave me a lot of literature, which I took home and I read. And I decided I'd, I'd come back again to Alcoholics Anonymous. And I didn't know that I wanted sobriety. I wasn't sure that that's what I wanted. I didn't think that's what I wanted. What I wanted was a lot of other stuff. And um, But there was enough of me still left to know that I didn't want to end up eating out of garbage cans. I mean, the other day, yesterday and even today, my sister and her husband and I walked down Pacific Garden Mall, and I saw those street people. I used to go feed those street people when I was drinking, and even in sobriety, um, because I knew that's where I was going to end up, you know, there but for the grace of God. That's where I should be, you know. Thank God I haven't gotten what I deserve, you know, because I wouldn't be here. But anyway, what those women had was enough to keep get me back to another meeting. And then I saw the cute guys, and I wanted to keep coming back to the meetings. Um, but enough stuff happened at the first couple meetings that I went to to where I realized that I was an alcoholic and that my life was over. And I didn't know what that meant. And I walked into those meetings, and I didn't know how to say hi. You know, by the time I walked into Alcoholics Anonymous, I was an animal, you know. But I was better than all of them, too. I mean, I literally crawled through the doors face down in the gutter looking down on the world, you know. Um, I was, I'd was i been more places than them, and, and so my arrogance was uh, phenomenal. So I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I came late to meetings, and I left early, and I didn't read the big book, and I didn't get the sponsor. And I desperately wanted to be clean and sober because I knew somehow or other that maybe that's where there was some hope for me. And I could not stop drinking and using drugs. And I was kind of hoping to sort of descend into sobriety on a cloud of uh, volume or quaaludes or pot or something. But they're kind of radical in Hawaii. And I want to make that clarification here if there's anybody who's who's new and who's in in... In the, in the room here, if you're here and you're an alcoholic and you're still um, taking that odd value now and then or a little snort of coke once in a while or a 
hit off of a marijuana joint from time to time. Keep coming back. We love visitors. But you are not sober. But sobriety, as I understand it, is clean and sober. Um, but I didn't think so when I first came in. <laughs> And I'd try taking that odd snort of cocaine and that uh, odd joint to sort of take the edge off a little bit because my feelings were starting to come out. And, um, and I found that from the very first anything that I ended up drunk, out of control drunk, and I wondered how it happened and I didn't want it to be that way. And a little piece of Kathy got chipped away in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I knew fear, and I knew terror, and I knew despair, and I knew loneliness, and I didn't know that that's what I knew, and I wanted it to stop. And I knew that my life was over, and I knew that I had done Alcoholics Anonymous the way I had done everything in my life. I was a thief, I was a liar, I was a cheat, and I was a phony, and I was ripping all you folks off of your time and your affection, and that I was going to go out, and if I walked out the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous just once more, that I would never make it back. And I knew that, and I call that a spiritual experience. Because that night I went to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I said to them, you guys, meetings are not enough. Like, I'm dying here. I can't stop drinking. And thank God there were people in that meeting to tell me the truth. And a woman t turned to me and she said, you're absolutely right. You know, the fellowship is not sobriety. And you can't stay sober on the fellowship. You need the steps. And we started them that night. And from that day to this, I haven't found it necessary to take a drink, a pill, a drug, or a fix of any kind. And that was November 18th, 1982. And for that, I'm truly grateful. <laughs> we are the miracle people. We are the miracle people. And um, and from that day, I started on an inventory the very next day. And um, that night, somehow or other, God had gave me the willingness to put it together that I was suffering from a hopeless condition of mind and body, from a disease of alcoholism that I didn't have until the moment I admitted that I was an alcoholic. And from that moment, hope began to dawn. You know, there was a chance there. And... Uh, and that was the problem. And I wanted to know what the problem was for years. I always thought it was you guys. I always found the problem in the men in the bars and the people that wouldn't give me the cars and the people who made me break into their houses and steal stuff because they wouldn't give me their shit, you know? Um, and I found out that the problem was that I was an alcoholic and that my life was unmanageable. And uh, But if I were to stay there, I would continue to get drinking because that's just the problem. And that night also I found out what the solution was, and the solution was that I was insane. I was hopelessly insane, and that they, only a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. And I didn't believe it, and I didn't trust it, but I didn't know what else to do. So I accepted it, you know. And I'd like to say that I accepted it with joy and gratitude, but I accepted it with extreme fear <laughs> because I was no longer going to be able to do what I wanted to do anymore. I understood that instinctively, and it was true. I wasn't able to. And then we took the third step, and uh, I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of something that didn't exist. <laughs> And uh, I was convinced it didn't exist. And uh, my sponsor said, don't worry about it. Fake it till you make it. Just act as if. And I said, okay, I can do that, you know. Um, as a matter of fact, I turned my will and my life over to the care of my sponsor. And it was good enough to keep me sober. And that's if that's all you can do, it's good enough for you. Her name is Noah. And if you don't have a sponsor, I suggest you get one like her. She, uh, she works the steps rigorously. Um, she has spent most of her sobriety walking the spiritual path. She's not afraid to tell the truth to herself or to anybody else. And she's the only one I know who can yell at me without raising her voice. <laughs> you know? And she saved my life. She literally saved my life. God, in his infinite wisdom, allowed himself to be used through her to save my life. And I don't know why and I don't understand it, but I'm eternally grateful for it. And we started on an inventory. 
And uh, I had to take account of all the things that I had done in my life. And the first part of the inventory was great because I got to write about all you assholes out there who hadn't given me what I needed, you know. And then I had to take account of where was I a fault. And I came to understand that I wasn't the worst person on the face of the planet. I came to understand that I wasn't the best person on the face of the planet. And I came to understand that um, that from this day forward that um, I was going to allow God to uh, do something about my defects of character. And maybe, just maybe, if I give Alcoholics Anonymous to all I've got, I just might stay sober. My sponsor told me and made it real clear to me that Alcoholics Anonymous doesn't promise that your life will get better. It doesn't promise that you'll get that job or that car or that man or those clothes or that school. What it promises that if you give this thing all you've got and you're willing to go to any lengths for it, you just might not have to take another drink. And by the time I got honest in Alcoholics Anonymous, that's all I wanted. I just didn't want to have to take another goddamn drink. And that's come true for me. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. And then we moved on to step six and seven after I dumped the inventory. And, uh, and it was where I understood. It was in six and seven that I got the relief. I understood that I'm a product of a loving God who has always been with me, has always wanted me to be happy, joyous, and free. And that I'm the one that turned away from that. And that if I stick close to him, it, she, I don't know. I still haven't figured out what it is. I don't know. I don't care, you know. <laughs> I'm sober. <laughs> um, that I just might have a chance at this life. And then when we got to the eighth and ninth step, I was absolutely terrified because I've done a lot of damage in my drinking. I, I went down hard, and I took some people down with me. You know, I, uh, I rejected... Uh, for one, my sister, who, who only needed me to love her, and that was asking too much from me, you know. And consequently, she started on her life of self-destruction. And, uh, and I've heard a lot of damage. I've heard a lot of people and done a lot of damage. And uh, I didn't know if there was any way I could really make amends for that, but we started. And it was the beginning of the end of isolation for me. The isolation started to stop. And it was only then that I realized that I'd been living in fear, terror, loneliness, despair, and isolation for so long, you know. And it started to stop. And, uh, and I went out and I made amends to all those people I could make amends to. I'm still in the process of doing that. <laughs> My amends list is very long. <laughs> It'll go on for years. Um, and then we get to the maintenance step. And I can't tell you how important... Steps 10, 11, and 12 are. In my sobriety, I tried to get away without doing steps 10, 11, and 12. I was about three years sober, and um, I decided that I knew all there was to know about getting sober and staying sober. Shit, I've written three or four inventories. I've been around the block. I'm into service and all this stuff. I don't have to do this stuff anymore. Besides that, God wasn't giving me what I wanted fast enough, so it was about time that I took over and started getting it for myself. Um, so I got involved with a relationship, was a very dishonest relationship with a man who happened to have a lot of money. <laughs> Gee, strange how that worked. Um, thinking that I could get the stuff, and I refused to look at the fact that God had given me a, a group of friends who loved me and supported me. God had gotten me to the university. God had gotten me a wonderful little apartment. God had gotten me dignity and self-respect. And God had given me three years of sobriety. And I chose to ignore that and decided I wanted the stuff. And I went out to get it. And I quit doing the 10th step because I started having to get dishonest to do some of the stuff I started doing in sobriety. And I quit working the 11th step because God wasn't working anymore and I needed to do it for a while. And I quit working the 12th step because those newcomers, I mean, they're really humiliating if you sit next to them at coffee. You know, they shake and talk and don't know what they're talking about. And so I quit doing the 12th step. And I started going to Alcoholics Anonymous meetings to check out what everyone was wearing and where they'd gone for dinner before the meeting. I didn't listen to what the speakers had to say. And uh, because I was going to get what I wanted. <clears throat> And I don't know how long that went on for, um, but I came to one day, I remember very clearly, I was sitting on the beach in Hawaii, and it all, my girlfriend turned to me, 
with that clarity of the eyes that, you know, other members of Alcoholics Anonymous have that you just hate when you're being dishonest, you know? It's like, God, don't look at me that way. <laughs> and she said, what are you doing? And I started crying. <laughs> and I didn't stop for six weeks, actually. And I realized that um, I had given Alcoholics Anonymous my best shot and it didn't work. That I was as dishonest as I had been the day I walked into uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. That I had thrown away every principle that had kept me sober. That my maintenance program was down the tubes. And I realized that the only hope for me was suicide. And I spent a period of six weeks trying to decide whether to pick up a drink, commit suicide, or try another goddamn day of sobriety. And I had to call people in this program and ask them, what should I do? <laughs> you know, do you think suicide or a drink would be better? And, um, and I came to understand through that period that alcoholism is a progressive disease. And I always thought when they said that, that if you kept drinking, you got worse. And what I've come to understand that my disease progresses in sobriety. And if my spiritual program does not keep pace with my disease in a very short time, I'll be in a position where I'm going to have to either kill myself or get drunk. Um, work the steps or die is the message. And uh, thank God those same people that helped me get sober were there for me when I needed them. And uh, they walked me through it. And they got me back on a spiritual path. Um, they helped me to enlarge my 11th step. And uh, they accepted me back with the love and the grace that only members of Alcoholics Anonymous can do. You know, I'd been a real asshole <laughs> for a long time. And um, and they still love me. And they let me keep coming back, you know. And since then, I've had to get real clear on what my priorities are. I just, I recently left those people. Um, there, I don't know if I can get through this without talk, without crying, but you guys don't care, right? You've all cried before. Um, God has been very kind to me. He put me on a beautiful island paradise to get me sober. He gave me, God drew a best friend who's walked with me through more than, more than I deserved. Gave me a loving sponsor and a loving fellowship that showed me how to be a sister how to be a friend, how to be a student, how to be an employer, employee, excuse me. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous taught me how to wear underwear, you know, how to show up for work. And uh, and I kept walking the, the spiritual path and doing the third step, and my life turned, and I ended up in California this last summer. And I got to uh, spend the summer with my family, my blood family, people who I had rejected, people I, who I had stolen and lied to for years and years. And God gave me the opportunity to spend three months with them and let them love me and let me love them. And it was an incredible experience. And as a result of walking this life and, and uh, working the steps and trying to do the best I can on a daily basis, my greatest dream has come true. I'm at the University of North Carolina um, doing stuff that I was not capable of doing seven years ago. And doing it okay. Um, I have gotten love and I have gotten dignity. And that fear and that despair and that terror and that loneliness that was my daily reality, I don't have anymore. I have moments of fear. There's been times in my sobriety where I've laid on the floor with animal sounds coming out of me because I didn't know what to do with the pain. You know, I don't want to give the impression that Sobriety was a piece of cake for me. My first year was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. It was so hard um, because all those feelings I never wanted to feel, I had to start feeling. My worst day sober is much worse than any day I'd ever had drinking because I was present for it. You know, I was there. And, uh, and the people in this program taught me how to hold on to whatever power I believe in and how to pick up that uh kit of spiritual tools that were given and uh, and keep walking just keep on keeping on for one more day no matter whether the wind's blowing through that hole in your gut or not you know and there's been many days when i've had to just show up even though i knew that i was going to die from the pain you know but i did i just showed up and i got through it and now i'm here now i'm at a conference speaking at a conference in Santa Cruz, California. I can't believe. But um, 
It's a miracle. It's just a miracle. I don't have any profound message. Um, the, the message to me is Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're new, for God's sakes, don't quit five minutes before the miracle happens for you. You know, keep coming back. And there's a whole lot more to Alcoholics Anonymous than just the meetings. Um, get a sponsor and work the steps. Get involved in the fellowship. The fellowship for me has given me a, added a dimension to my life. You know, if it hadn't been for the fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, my life would be stupid, boring, and glum. But, um, but it's there where I, I learn the things I need to learn and there where I get the love and the fun and the joy and the excitement, you know. And there's bad times and there's hard times and there's sad times and life keeps going on. But the greatest gift that I've gotten is I've been able to stay so, sober through it all. I've been able to help one or two people along the way. And I've been able to experience for the very first time in my life what life is. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Thank you for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.